our buddies in the Vargas and our buddies online right now, even as we speak. Hello, world! <laughs> I am Aaron Freeman. That there beautiful smiling face is the one and only Professor Peggy Mason, professor of neurobiology at the University of Chicago. Collectively, we are the Chicago Brain Buddies. We believe that to study the brain is to, is to better understand human behavior and understanding behavior makes it easier to forgive people and that makes it easier to be happy. Hi, Peggy. Hi there. Uh, We're talking about something unhappy. Well, yes, but wait, let's talk about something that we shouldn't be talking about because, because I took understanding the brain and the neurobiology of everyday life and I know that there should not be such a thing as a headache because brains do not feel pain. You can mush around there. They don't hurt. There's no nociceptors. There are no nociceptors in the pain, in the brain. That is true. So this is a mistake. But, okay. So Aaron, how, how do you feel? How do you feel pain? Well, you feel pain when the, uh, the, uh, your, your, um, afferent neuro, uh, nociceptor, nociceptors, uh, get, send signals from the very, wherever the body, however in the body, there's a disruption and it goes into your little brain and you perceive it. So okay. is the, are the afferents enough? You're going to say that you have to have a brain in order to receive the, the afferent signal. I am. Wow. And what is the proof of that pudding? I don't know. What is the proof of that pudding? The proof of that pudding is amputation pain. Oh, oh, that, uh, a phantom limb. So that you can. So, have so it's that it's that you don't have the limb anymore. There are no afferents, but the pain is up here. It's in the brain. The pain perception is in the brain. It is. It can be independent of any uh, input from the periphery. Input, noxious input, okay. information. True information. The experiences up here. I was. I'm just been reading a, a unbelievable, unbelievably devastating book or a story called. Um, the book is called Radium Girls, and it's about the uh, dial painters uh, from the 20s and 30s. Um, and dial painters. I don't know what a dial painter. So they they paint the dials with radium to make the radium to make the dials glow in the dark. Oh, I remember this. And and so they they have to paint it onto very thin dials. So to do that, they take the brush, lip dip paint, lip dip paint. So they're constantly getting radium into their mouths. They get these alpha radioactive waves that are just in the gums and the gums disintegrate. I mean, it's just a hideous, hideous story. But they also get these sarcomas. So one of the things that happens with radium poisoning is that they get a sarcoma. So this woman gets a sarcoma in the bend of her neck of her, of her arm, and it's it's little, but it grow. They grow rapidly, and eventually the um, physicians say, you know, you got to cut it off, or else it's it's going to kill you. Um, and so, it, and it's extremely painful. So they cut it off. And what happens? She's got no more arm. Does she have pain? Yes. The same okay. freaking pain as before. It's a horrible, horrible story. And I just read that this morning. I was just like, oh my God. You know, that is the real, that's the real power of the brain to, to create the experience of pain. The pain does not exist anywhere. It doesn't exist in the arm doesn't exist out in the world. It doesn't exist anywhere, but it is perceived using your, your, uh, your brain. All right, now, but we're going to talk about specifically um, a, a wonder, some really good news. Enough of this really depressing stuff, okay? We're going to talk about something really good because there's a brand new treatment for migraine headaches. But migraine headaches is not exactly the most accurate way to describe the condition being treated. Why not? Oh, because it is because migraines are not merely, and the pain of migraine is not merely in your head. 
Right. Like. So, so in fact, it is not a headache. It is. It would be more accurately described as a meningiache. <laughs> what is a meningiache? Meningiache. So meninges are the membranes that cover the the um, brain, and while the brain has no sensitivity, it has no um, nerve fibers that can sense noxious stimulation. The meninges do. So these coverings are very sensitive to little perturbations and they signal, send signals into the central nervous system that are perceived as pain. So I just want uh, briefly, there are three layers of meninges. Right. Are all of them uh, nociceptive? Can all any one of them hurt? Or any, or, or probably, like probably mostly the pia and the dura. Okay. The, so the, there's the pia, the arachnoid, and the dura. It's probably the pia and the dura, the the innermost okay. and the outermost that are most sensitive. So uh, what, when we're talking pain in the head as, as, as related to um, uh, migraine, we're talking about pain in the dura. And there are two hypotheses for how that pain is generated. There are two hypotheses for what is going on in migraine. So first of all, what what's the difference between migraine and a headache? So as, as Many of you may know migraine is something that is accompanied by um, nausea. A lot of people they'll they'll block off the window because they don't like the light. That's called photophobia. They're phobic about the light. The light is uncomfortable to them. Um, they're inactive. Uh, they go to sleep. And you know one of the open questions is if you get the nausea and the photophobia, but you don't, have, and you, and you want to go to bed, is that a migraine? Even if you don't have a splitting headache, right. um, you know, and, and that's one of the interesting questions I, I, my set, my hunch is yes, that is a migraine that the headache is, is a common symptom, but not a required symptom. Okay. Um, so, the in 18 in 1948 excuse me 1948 wolf uh dis proposed that migraines stem from uh vasodilation that the cerebral blood vessels were being stretched and that that was what caused the the pain eventually um that has been attacked sort of steadily uh, for a lot of reasons, um, such as if you look at the period, uh, you know, migraine is a, is a, is a hours long event. It takes a while. And the period that is associated with pain, sometimes blood flow is either normal or even lower, suggesting that the blood vessels may be constricted. Um, another piece of, uh, uh, evidence against the idea of vasodilation being uh, a critical factor is that you can vaso you can cause vasodilation and not cause a migraine. Okay. Okay. So there are some substances that will dilate the vessels, but will not cause a migraine. And there are also uh, substances that will cause migraine without vasodilating. Right. Um, so so you can have a, the, all these dissociations. Um, so the, the other alternative is that it's a problem with the, the neurons, the, the nerves, the nerves that, um, pick up the signal and send that signal back into the nervous system. So these are the afferents, the sensory nerves. So those sensory nerves are responding to stuff that they shouldn't respond to. So I think so. It's easy, so the the two two of the theories are one vasodilation that the veins are being pushed out for whatever reason, pushed far out, and that stretching is causing pain. And the other is that there's some sort of neurological problem. So there's because there's there's a neuroinflammatory response is what some people say, right? Right. So that the neur the neurons get active, they they release substances at their ends. We don't really think about. Uh, sensory neurons that are sending information into the central nervous system, well, it, it turns out that they also can carry action potentials in the other direction, and they can release substances at the end. And this typically is thought to have 
beneficial um, effects, but it can also have detrimental effects as it, as it, as some would argue it does in migraine. So the idea is that you have a neurogenic event. It starts with the nerves. It doesn't start with the vessels and then go to the nerves. It starts with the nerves. And then one consequence of that, a common consequence, but not a required consequence, is that the blood vessels vasodilate. So this is this is essentially, here's an here's a analogy. Every time you see a bad car crash you see an ambulance. Okay? Right. right. Every time you, so one could say, if the, you always see them together, well, maybe that ambulance caused the car crash. <laughs> okay. But of course, what we know is that the ambulance comes because the car crash happened. Right. And so that is, that's the analogy that in fact, what we're, we're seeing is, um, is, what, what people would call an epiphenomenon. Yes, it happens, but no, it's not causally related. Got it. So, but now, so now this brand, this brand new drug called a Amovig. 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 So Amovig um, works in a novel way involving uh, CGRP. CGRP is one of these substances, one of the peptides that's contained in the sensory um, nerve fibers. CGRP stands for what's that? CGRP stands for calcitonin gene related peptide. Calcitonin gene related peptide, okay. And uh, it it's a pretty famous peptide because it's very important out in the periphery, along with um, another peptide, substance P. So substance P and CGRP they set up this uh, cascade of bad events out in the periphery that sw swell the tissue, cause the blood vessels to, to dilate and to get leaky. So stuff comes out of the blood vessels, stuff such as bradykinin and serotonin. These are nasty chemicals that are going to make you hurt. And then it also um, degranulates mast cells. So then the mast cells start pouring out histamine and protons. And you've got this big soup of nasty chemicals that are just making that tissue very, very responsive and unhappy. But CPRG does not cause, uh, well, so people who have migraines have a tendency to produce more CPRG than those. CGRP, who, yeah. Yeah, CGRP. And yeah. So, but but a, 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 an abundance of CPR, uh, CGRP does not necessarily cause migraines. Correct. So there's a balance in there about having being sensitive to it. Or tell me more about CPRG. So I mean, the thing the thing is that that um, the drugs that have been used. So so let's say the ergotamines. Ergotamines have been used for a long, long time in the treatment of of migraine with some effect. I don't know what an ergotamine is. It's a it's a substance that's derived from a family of fungus. Okay. So, you know, it's an alkaloid and it, um, it's very effective. Okay. In treating that, migraine. Or it was, it was the standard of, of migraine treatment for a long, long time. And did it, uh, I, my understanding is that the problem with some of the earlier migraine treatments was that they were not well tolerated, liver troubles, because what happens is that the old ones were, were aimed at the vascular system. So they tried to constrict the blood vessels. Believing they that the, the vasodilation was the problem. So they tried to constrict the blood vessels. What happens if you constrict the blood vessels? Um, you, your body gets less blood? No. No. You have the same volume. Yes, yes. But 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 if you constrict the blood vessels, your heart has to pump harder. You pump heart pumps harder to push all that, push the uh, the same amount of blood through a small, through smaller tubes. So smaller tubes, same volume means pressure goes up. Right. We, we don't really like hypertension. It's not okay. really something we're really excited about. Okay. So um, that's, that's been a, a scourge of these uh, migraine uh, treatments is that they cause hypertension acutely or chronically. And that they, for example, um, one of the big problems that that people f are afraid of is 
these my these uh, treatments during pregnancy when you have a chance also for developing preeclampsia, right? Amovig does not attempt to reduce dilation. No, it's a it's a CGRP receptor antagonist. So it's trying oh, to... Uh, CPRG, a receptor antagonist. What is that? Those are... No, so CGRP is this peptide that's being pumped out too much. Okay. But if it was just being pumped out and that's all that happened, who cares? The right. only reason we care is because this peptide meets this receptor. receptor. Mm -hmm. And we want to say no. So we're going to put something... In between there, we're going to stop it. We're going to put a blockade, and that's what a receptor antagonist is. And and, it, and usually, it's an antibody, right? And that's that is not this normal. is this one. It's not always an antibody, but in this case, it's a monoclonal antibody. Yeah, and that's a relatively novel approach to treating um, migraine. Yeah, it is the CGRP. The drugs that act on CGRP are the newest. Right. They. Uh, uh, excitement, shall we say? But now, let's. As wonderful as this is, uh, as I understand it, this can reduce the, the for people who have uh, chronic migraines, as in more than fifteen per month. I think it's more than four. It was they had to have more than four a month oh, to this, qualify right. in, the, in the study. There, yeah. So that uh, so this can reduce the number of migraines by fifty percent in fifty percent of the patients. Right. Which does, is not mass, but I suppose if you are one of those people having 15, 20 a, a month or even four a month, having half the... Uh, well, and presumably you're using it on patients that are not responding to the right. the cheaper drugs. Now, this is now, this speaking with this drug costs something like $6,500 a year, maybe 69 it could be, but between six and $7,000 okay. a year, uh, which... I guess that doesn't seem to be in the world of drugs all that massively expensive. I'm just curious about how you think about that. It doesn't seem all that massively expensive, but I mean, it's. I mean, that's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. I, I don't know how much of it's reimbursed. Um, those kinds of things I, I, I don't know about. I, I kind of think that the. It's, it's also notable that these studies are done by people that are. Um, contracted by the companies okay so it's it, it, let me give you a million dollars tell me if this works tell me if this drug that i made works is good but let me so but uh, one of the other things i thought in my understanding is that it is not known exactly how these uh um why this all works why blocking the cprg receptors works well the, I, so the argument is that it works because these these nociceptors, these sensory um, nerve fibers, and and it should be said that within the cranium, you cannot, you don't have nerve fibers that are hooked up to central neurons that will say, "Oh, you just tickled my my uh, skull," or "You just uh, blew on my pia," or that you just cooled or warmed my dura. No, you get one output. Whatever you put into it, the output is stop it. <laughs> um, and so, uh, so these these fibers they are called nociceptors. They respond to things that shouldn't be there, injurious things. I mean, some of it is is just a tickle, but you shouldn't be tickling inside of somebody's skull. Okay, so anything that it responds to is by almost by definition injurious and um and what it what happens in migraine what appears to happen in migraine is that the sensitivity of these uh sensory neurons is increased so now instead of taking you know i have to push like this to get it to be activated now all i have to do is this ah and so one of the, or actually, I, I guess you didn't see that. So instead of pushing down far, you just have to push a little bit. And so one of the things that um, Rami Burstein did this a while ago, he showed that if you put inflammatory soup on 
um, on a dura that the sensory nerve fibers will now respond to the mechanical stimulation that's produced by the um, by the pulse in the blood vessels. Really, the blood vessels are doing this right with every heartbeat. Right. And that in a in a migrainous rat, um, that is now enough to excite the nociceptors. So uh, you can imagine what that, how that feels. So are we certain that we actually know? Let me just say we have the Chicago Brain Buddies, Aaron Freeman, Professor Peggy Mason, and we. Uh, if we, the goal here is to be able to ask Professor Mason about these. The, this particular drug and the mechanisms by which migraines occur and the mechanisms by which brain the pain is experienced. So we would love to get your questions or comments. Here you got her right there. She's waiting. Look at her. She's baiting at the breath. Wait, baiting, chomping at the bit is what I meant to say. <laughs> chomping at the bit, baiting at the breath for your questions. Please leave them right here below. Uh, but so is it your understanding that it is clearly understood how the mechanism by which these this new drug uh, what is it again? Uh, Amber, Amber, Amber. Am Amavig. Amavig. Yes, Amavig. Uh, is it? Is it your understanding that it's well understood how this works, the mechanism by which it relieves pain? So it's it's blocking the CGRP receptors that are on the um, on the neuron, but they're you know I mean it is a little bit there there are CR CGRP receptors on other uh, elements in the area. Um, including blood vessels. So it is a little bit uh, murky, shall we say. <laughs> but, you know, now there, I must tell you, is one of the things that, that I find most elevating and hopeful about this whole little business, which is that, like much else in medicine and science, the mere fact that we have a somewhat murky understanding of the specific mechanics doesn't stop us from making things that can do some good. Well, we're not we're not making anything that's doing good. We're we are empirically finding that something that is there might do some good. Well, but I said if it, if it relieves fifty percent of the headaches in fifty percent of the people, I call that good. And yeah. just the fact that it's not thoroughly understood. But they're not. I mean, no one's making it in the sense that oh, I get the mechanism, so I can design a drug. That's what I'm saying. We'll do this. I I just I just throw a bunch of drugs. These are drug companies. They're throwing right. a bunch of drugs at a system, and they're seeing yeah. what sticks. And, and then they, as it as it passes through enough tests, it goes it goes through increasingly more uh, tests that are, that are uh, mandated by the government. Right. Yeah, but I'm just saying. I think that that's really a wonderful. Thing well, I mean, I, I actually don't like it because, <laughs> because you, you it is sort of it's mechanistically blind. Yes, it's true. Um, but you know, let me say, I, I'm fond of pointing out that, that virtually everybody I every no physicist I know thinks that the standard model of particle physics is correct. Nobody I know thinks that they can describe more than five percent of the physical universe, nonetheless. You can launch a rocket ship from Canaveral in January of 2006 and have it land nine years later within, you know, 500 meters of where it should be near Pluto. So yeah, but that's because you totally understand those that part of physics. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. We, you know, we can make a drug, for example, we can make a drug that emit or leads to more dopamine production. Uh and yet, we don't know why the dopamine's not being released and why the dopamine cells are dying in Parkinson's. So, um, and eventually, if, if you replace or, or give dopamine uh, therapy, you're going to eventually, typically, that stops working. So you're really left with a, with a it's a Band-Aid because you don't know the mechanism. You know, I think that Parkinson's is a really good example because you you get the band aid and it will work for five ten years, but eventually um, it tends not it tends to stop working, and then you're basically back where you were with even a little bit of uh, more problem because because of this 
long-term treatment, now you have some additional problems. Well, I think what you're saying is that it bothers you because you really love the mechanism and you want to know how the heck it exactly works. Well, no, it's not, it's not even that, but I do love that. But the thing is that it's, it's a level of explanation. So, oh, Parkinson's is a loss of dopaminergic neurons. Well, why did those dopaminergic neurons up and die? I just that only gets you so far. It it just it's it's not um, satisfying, and in the end, it will it will not produce lasting uh, treat you know lasting efficacious treatment. Well, yeah, but again, it, it, this is an improvement. This particular medicine is an improvement. Like, really, 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 side dog. <laughs> so it's an improvement. There's a, like this particular medicine. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Improvement. And that's, and that's, and again, even without a thorough understanding that that's what gives me hope, but I do understand, of course, obviously we want to get uh, the really figure. Okay. Out. I just want to share with you uh, now that we're talking about migraine, I'm going to share with you my one exciting event. I'm in my lab. This was about probably 20 years ago. Okay. And I look up at the white wall and I see black and white stripes in a, in a basically a quarter of an arc, a quarter of a circle, yeah. um, alternating black and white stripes. And they're going around as though they're going around on a racetrack. And it, and it started little and it went out and out and out and out. It got bigger, 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 bigger. And then it, and then it was gone. What was that? Do you know what it was? Okay. No. That was an aura. Oh, really? That was an aura. And I and then I never ha- but I never had a headache. And I just was so happy because I had an aura and I didn't even have to pay for it. <laughs> okay then. And a non aura so is there a, there's no explanation for that? That was the one offer. It just happened. It was just good drugs. I I no, I was not taking any drugs. Oh well. All right. <laughs> just, just a happenstance, you know, one-off happenstance, yeah. All right. But I liked it. So again, so what gives you what it, this gives you hope? What, what the optimistic part of this particular little endeavor is that says you? Well, um, yeah. You there's more. There are more arms in the armament against migraine, so that's great because migraine is really an unpleasant experience. Yeah, and, and three times more prevalent in women than in men. Interesting. Yes, enough. that's true too. And that, we we don't even need to go there. Well, let me just say this is Peggy Mason, professor of neurobiology at the University of Chicago. Uh, you can check out her blog, thebrainissocool dot com. See, we have the little scroll. Can you see that? There's a little scroll there of the, the, the URL of the brain is so cool. Anyway, but she's Peggy Mason. I'm learning. I'm learning. I'm learning. And you can check out my vlog, uh, Science Today, on you. Tube. So we're here every Thursday, and we very much appreciate you watching. We appreciate you watching live. We appreciate you watching uh, in the replay. So, Peggy, next week, I look forward to seeing you, my dear, beloved friend. Okay. We'll talk to you next week. All right. Thank you guys for watching. Mwah, 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 mwah.